No, no, no. Not, I'm not a rap. That's an inside joke. 1927. Let's go back to the Accelerated Dragon. And he plays the Smith Mora. Now, I'm not going to take the pawn. And this plays back into the psychology of Gambit players. When you resist their kind of territory, uh, they get frustrated. So what can Black do here uh, by way of refusing the Smith Mora? What is the best way to refuse it? Droopy Miller, thank you for the three months. We can transpose into the Allop and Sicilian. We can transpose into the Allop and Sicilian by playing Knight F6. I'll explain this in greater depth after the game. So we've trans literally transposed into the Allop, which is also annoying, uh, which I've played. The Queen takes D4 is the way that most Smith Mora players actually go here. So uh, this I actually know very well. Um, well, I know not very well. I know it decently. So you go E6 to defend the Knight. Uh, Queen takes D4 is a very dangerous line if Black doesn't know what to do. Uh, of course, I would refer you to Mark Esserman's amazing book, Mayhem and the Mora. And I don't say amazing about a lot of books, so it's a labor of love. Uh, Mark is the ultimate specialist in the Mora. You should listen to him rather than me. But as far as I know, uh, the move here is f5. We chase the queen away. And now this is the key. Let me remember. So let me actually try to remember my analysis. Yes. So here's the thing. White wants to play c4. We go b5 here. We sacrifice the pawn in order to get queenside counterplay. This is still theory. And um, he doesn't take the pawn. And now I think we go either a5 or we can develop the bishop first. So let's go a5, continuing to expand. And then bishop a6, basically creating that potential skewer against the queen. Knight to a4. Now this one I already don't know. Maybe I'm still caught in theory. Let me think about this. So he wants queen h5. He wants queen h5, and uh, that's got kind of concerning. And he also wants to take on d5. Can we defend against both threats at the same time? Well, we can drop the knight back to e7. Not glamorous, but I guess I messed up here. I don't know. Uh, this guy, this guy out prepared me. So um, we'll see. But uh, that's not the end of the world. Now we can get our queen to c7 in order to pressure the pawn on e5. All right, relax, focus, Grassy. We will. We will see. <laughs> Plenty of 1900s know this much theory, uh, particularly if, um, okay, so rookie one. Now, uh, there are a couple of problems here that we need to solve here. Uh, the, the first is the problem of this bishop, right? This bishop is not developed, but if we go g6, we create holes in our position um, that, that he can potentially occupy. But again, it's all about the priorities. Our top priority here is to complete our development. Come what may, by hook or by crook. We're going to fianchetto the bishop, and then we're going to try to castle so that I don't get checkmated in the center of the board. Miss skewer on b4. Nope, I actually saw that. Um, I did see the move before, and uh, he has c4 in response to that. So I did actually spot that move, uh, but I don't believe it was that good. Okay, so he goes b4. That is a very odd move. I, I mean, I'm not going to really react to it. I'm just going to complete my development. Okay. So bishop to b2. Um, now, let's unpack this for a second. I'm not sure why I can't just take on e5, uh, but I'm actually going to trust him, and I'm going to castle here. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that this is still like semi-preparation, so I'm just going to complete my development. I think he had some ideas like c4. Okay, but now I'm not going to trust him any longer. What should black do here? I mean, and let's keep it simple. I think that we can now just do what? Yeah, we can just take the pawn. We can just take and, and take, and I actually... Um, I actually don't see what he has in return for this. Okay. And uh, we're up a pawn. We still have this very nice outpost for the knight. Now, this bishop on a6 is sort of dull, right? But it's got a lot of potential energy, especially if we play the move b4. So uh, what should we do here? How do we prepare the move b4? Well, there's a couple things to notice here. He's attacking the pawn on, d5, on b5. He's sort of semi-attacking because if he takes it, he walks himself into a very nasty little pin. Uh, but actually, I think he can get away with this. And I'll explain this after the game. So, huh. This is a complicated situation. What I'm going to do, let me think about this. I'm going to go queen to a5. The idea is simple. I'm, I just want to defend the pawn first, and then I want to go knight b to d5. I think that this queen is actually going to be very well placed here. It's going to put pressure on the pawn, which is going to discourage him from bringing his rook into the game. Yeah, I could have moved the other knight, but then this knight would have gotten uncomfortable. Okay, now we're going to go knight b to d5, according to plan. H4 is a good move. Uh, he's he's starting to pressure and massage my king side, which is kind of weak. 
So it's time for me to act. Okay, so takes, takes. And now we're going to go b4, opening up the bishop. It's a battle on both flanks. Queen to d2, though, very strong move here. Um, and uh, my king side is in some trouble here, so I'm going to have to be very careful about it. Okay, he does it. So let's just take this pawn. Let's just get rid of it. Uh, and, and it does ruin my king side a little bit, that is true. But here's the thing. Uh, he doesn't have any pieces on the king side yet, so it's not like checkmate is imminent. Uh, he can put his queen on g5, but I, yep, he does. Uh, and, and but 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 I can bring my defenders in as well. Uh, and I want to emphasize that you shouldn't be afraid of moves like these just because they look intimidating. Because now I've brought my own queen into the game, my queen's going to have something to say about the threat of knight g5. Okay, so he should definitely not trade queens. He's playing very well, but I think we'll be able to survive this. Okay. Yeah, his pawn on e5 is really working in my favor. We again have the same situation. Three pieces biting on the same pawn, which is very much to my favor. Okay. What should we do here to complete the defensive operation? What should we do to complete the defensive operation? We, have, we're, we aren't done on the king's side. We need to get the queen to g6. We need to get the queen to g6. So that knight g5 is, is, is no longer dangerous because it will not attack h7. Okay, so rook c1, I'm going to respond to with rook to c8. I'm not going to let him run circles over me, get control of the c file. Also, c3 square, something we should keep in mind uh, for the future, potential outpost. Okay, well, this guy is just good, but uh, he's, he's legit. So a couple of options here. He wants to take on d5 and ruin our structure. That... It would not be acceptable thing to allow. Uh, so what should we do? What are the options here? We could consider f4. That's actually a super interesting move. Uh, but but I don't really want to allow bishop takes d5. So bishop b7 allows his knight to get around to d6. So let's actually go knight to c3. Let's use that outpost that we created on the previous move. And f4, by the way, ripping open the king. Yeah, he made a very strong move here, which I sort of semi-underestimated. Um, let me think. For a second. Thank you, Goblets, for the tier one. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very nasty move. Very, very nasty move. And knight e2 is possible, but then my knight gets passive. Let's tickle him, actually. Let's go bishop h6. Uh, let's bring the bishop into the game and tickle his rook. I think bishop h6 is actually a very strong move. Uh, and it's a very important move, because otherwise my knight was getting undermined. Very complex game, and I love this. I'll be able to talk through a lot of concepts after the game, but in the interest of time, I have to make some moves fast. Okay, now we can bring the other bishop. Where is the rook going? This is the power of having active pieces, as Gobla's with a five gifted keeps the hype going. Amazing. His rook's not going anywhere. All of our pieces guarding the rook's potential escape squares. Okay, so he takes on c3. Now, we don't want to rush to take the rook. We can just play b takes c3, and uh, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place because if he moves the rook, then he allows our pawn to push forward, and he's going to have to give up a piece for it, which is exactly what's going to happen. He's, he has to give up the knight for it, and now we are officially winning. We are up a full piece, and we still have the potential to rip open the king side. Guys, uh, please keep the unfounded accusations on the basis of two moves to a minimum. Um, that's not what we're about here. Uh, trust me, if somebody actually is cheating, I usually have a good sense of it, and I will make that known. But, uh, I, in you know, put yourself in the shoes, and I don't mean to lecture anybody here. Uh, we've all gotten paranoid. But put yourself in this guy's shoes. If you're playing a good game, would you like, uh, you know, would you like for an entire community to turn against to turn against you because you happen to know the theory? So just common sense. Uh, justice will be served. Okay, uh, so let's lift the rook up to h5. Uh, you know, so, okay, now we're going to lift the rook up, and this is just going to be checkmate to the queen, and the game is over. Okay, so that's winning. Um, now, all right, uh, that was a nice move. Um, so, uh, Smith Mora. Now, D takes C3 is the accepted Smith Mora. Again, I would defer to Mark's analysis here in his book. Um, Knight F6. 
So the accuracy, I know people are curious. Uh, so the accuracy was probably not too high from my end. Let's see. It's analyzing it. Just one second. Jay Root, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, so his accuracy was... It was 61%. Okay, so he made a lot of mistakes. 88.7 for me. Uh, he played a very nice game. Let's not take anything away from him. Uh, but, you know... If you make up your mind after three moves, then uh, you're not giving the guy a chance. Thank you. Thank you, TCRH, for the 300. Appreciate the message. So I think that my mistake was the move bishop a6. I think I forgot to play bishop e7. And the purpose behind bishop e7 is to stop the knight from getting to h4. Uh, and, and, and that's the key move that I missed. Then you play bishop a6. I confuse the move order. And very nicely done by him, knight h4. Uh, opening up the possibility for queen h5. So I had to drop my knight back. I had to double it back for completed. Uh, here he started going wrong with b4. Um, thanks, Shark. Appreciate it. Um, here he started going wrong with b4. I think he should have gone here and maybe, you know, chiseled his way into my position here with bishop f6. Um, and uh, that's sort of how I think he should have nurtured the initiative. Uh, well, you know, I've gotten accused myself, and I understand. Uh, that, you know, uh, definitely people have accused me of cheating and uh, fresh freeze. And I understand it's a human instinct uh, to get frustrated when somebody's playing. Well, cheating is a huge problem. I'm the first person to say that. Uh, but we have to be equitable as much as possible because uh, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Uh, Crow Kaka, thank you for the prime. And fresh freeze as well. Okay. Um... So, and, and I, uh, I, I've shared a funny story before about getting accused. I was playing an unnamed Grandmaster on ICC. This was years ago, and I had a secret account on ICC. So I played a cheater, and I, I think I drew him because of, it flagged him. But uh, then I noticed that that Grandmaster was also playing uh, the cheater. And I messaged him. I was like, you're playing a clear cheater. Uh, no, no, I said, this guy is a cheater. And he said, just like you. <laughs> I was like, dang, girl. I'm making his opinions known. So I get it, but let's move on. So anyways, we castle, we complete our development, win a pawn. Now here's the thing. Knight B to D5 is what people uh, is is what uh, people were sort of wanting me to do, but he takes on B5. And here's the key thing. It seems like we're winning the knight on B5, but we're not. How can he defend that knight? How can he defend that knight? Yeah, this is an authorized speedrun account, Jesse Rogers, so every, people are aware. A4 is the move, exactly. Pawns are very good defenders. It's an anchor. So remember the key principle. When you can do something with a pawn, you usually should, versus doing it with a piece. Okay, so B4 opening up the diagonal, taking the pawn, and then getting the queen into the defense. Okay, these are the moves that won me the game. Queen D8, Queen E8. These are the moves that a lot of people... Uh, would be unwilling to play, I think, because they're retreating moves. It looks like we've done something wrong. Uh, but the priority here is to get is to beef up our kingside security, uh, contesting the c-file. Now, knight c3 was a little hasty, but bishop h6 here, how did I see this move? Well, I basically, I tried to think logically about what's making his position tick. What's making his position tick are three things, right? The pawn, which is undermining my pawn, the bishop, and the rook. That's like a mechanism, right? You can think of that in a vacuum. Can we try to disrupt that mechanism in some way? Can we attack the bishop? I consider this move. This would have been a very reasonable move, uh, but I was worried about putting my knight on the rim. Can we win the pawn? I mean, no, because if we take the pawn, we drop the knight, but the rook is a weak li link. I and mean, I mentioned this before. Usually the strongest piece is the easiest piece to attack because it has to respond to most attacks. And that's why I settled on bishop h6. He could have shut me down with f4. But that would have created a weakness on g3. Then we can go knight a4, and he his queen is kind of tied down to the pawn. Okay, so um, yeah, I know some people were thinking that, and this is just winning. Yeah, f4 was possible. Um, what's up, Logic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I've been, yeah. Um, well, I'm excited to hear what um, what 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 this is that you mentioned. But uh, anyways, we've got, we've got, as if all of the hype wasn't enough, we got the man himself in the chat as well. Um, the absolute freaking man in the chat himself. Okay, 
So, um, but basically, yeah, this is just winning for black because the rook is um, the rook is just completely trapped. What would you say the main takeaway is? Well, first of all, um, theoretically speaking, uh, I'm not immune to screwing up in the opening. Okay, I'm not immune. Blood I thank you for the tier one. I'm not immune uh, to confusing stuff. Okay, and, and I did that here. So don't think that just because, you know, I'm a GM or something, I know everything about the opening. I do stupid stuff all the time, but uh, I didn't panic and I prioritized the right things, which is completing the development. Then I took the pawn. And, and the main thing that won me the game was recognizing when you need to make these unglamorous moves. Okay, these unglamorous moves are what are the, are the glue moves that win you the game, right? And, and if you can know when to make them, uh, you stop your opponent's threats and uh, you you know, you, you end up in much better shape. Let me see. Doesn't Bishop G7 lose da, da, da? How to recognize? Well, if it was that simple, uh, everybody would be a GM. But I'm trying my best to, uh, you know, to flesh out the thought process. Why didn't you take the rook when it was trapped? Well, uh, because basically, I, again, there's no rush. If we take the rook, then he plays bishop takes p4, and at least he curbs his losses here, not only is he going to lose his rook, but if he moves it, he loses more stuff than that. So this is just, uh, I'm just going for more here than just the exchange. But here we go. No time wasted. Another game. Let's hope. Thank you, Jay Grindahl, for the five gifted. Okay. So he plays the Karokan defense, which is, we, we've encountered it a couple of times. Black prepares to go d5. Now we know that we want to control the center here. And he goes d6. He doesn't go d5. Okay. So basically, uh, what am I going to do now? I'm simply going to develop my pieces. Which is, um, which is what you basically do in the opening. My opponent is just pushing his pawns out, uh, which is weird. Uh, it's weird, but I don't have to change my strategy because my opponent's doing something weird. What should I do in this position? How should we continue developing? And what's sort of the best, the simplest way of developing our pieces? We're going to keep it simple here, keep it old school. Who can tell me the simplest possible move? We could play, sorry, we could play f4 to control the center, but what I'm going to do is simply go knight f3. No, knights before bishops is the key role. Now I'm going to develop my bishop. Now I'm going to castle. In the meantime, he's just trolling me. He's pushing all his pawns out. He thinks he's being intimidating or funny, uh, neither of which are true. Okay, maybe he's being funny. Now, here's the thing. He finally developed a piece. Thank you, Mr. X. When your opponent plays this passively, you guys already know kind of the general thing that we have to do which is to open up the center. Because by opening up the center, we're going to allow my pieces uh, to just to actually infiltrate. Otherwise, he's going to get away with this. So we need a plan. Now, the obvious way of opening the center is to go e5. But then he's going to go d5 and keep things shut. So what should I do? How should I smash the center open and keep it open? Should I go e5? No, I shouldn't. What should I do? Let's get that hammer in and let's go d5. And I'm going to play a little bit faster. We had another plan that would have been even better, and I'll explain it after the game. But here, this is simple. Now, he's trying to close the center. Look at this pawn on e5 very carefully. What I want to do here is I want to push my pawn out to f4 in order to contest that pawn, in order to open up that e-file, which is the main artery to his king. But I can't do that, right? Because there's a knight in the way. Where should we put the knight? Let's go knight d2. I didn't choose this square at random. This knight could then travel to c4 and attack the b6 pawn. Okay, he stops me from going f4. Now, knight c4 immediately would be fine, but then he would push his pawn out to b5 and attack my knight. Um, what should I do to preemptively stop him from pushing this pawn? Kind of like a surgeon, you know, you're, you're handcuffing that pawn. We should go a4. We use our pawn to prevent his pawn from moving. And on the next move, we're going to sandwich this knight on c4. And we've got a very nice position here. We haven't really fully opened up the center, but his position is really full of holes. One of those holes is f5. We're going to stick a bishop there. Just keep on increasing the pressure. And guess what? Well, we've got this e file, right? We want to open up the file. Uh, but we can't do that yet. we got to prepare it. Let's prepare it by going rookie one. And we're actually kind of ready to play f4. But okay, so he shuts down that e-file. Um, let's continue sort of chiseling our way uh, into his position. How do we do that? We can deploy our queen. But I want to go a5 to create this little outpost from a knight on b6. Ooh, that's not a good move by him. What should we take with, the knight or the rook? What do you guys think? 
And again, those of you who are sort of like not fully following, I will explain everything after the game in far more depth. You can see this is a five minute game, so I have to play fast. Some things I cannot explain, I don't have the time to. We take with the knight, why? Because we attack the bishop, we wanna play actively, we wanna recapture in a way that creates a threat. Also, this knight has access to an outpost. Now we're gonna lift our rook up, potentially aiming for c4, where it's gonna chase the queen away. Remember, rooks can be activated too, but we can't go rook c4 immediately, right? Why not? Because we drop the knight. So can one of you brave souls tell me how can we first defend the knight so that we can then deploy our rook to c4? Yes, sir, knows knows all, does know the move. And it's queen a1. What am I doing? Well, that queen's gonna guard the knight. Oh, and he's gonna regret this. He is going to regret this because we're gonna take it. Now we're gonna complete our plan. Now we've given up a pawn, but I've sacrificed it. I haven't blundered it. And the reason I sacrificed it is to open up that center. Remember that that was our initial plan and our opponent has basically done that for us. That's what a sacrifice is in chess. It's when you give something up for some reason, right? You give up a pawn in order to do something that's good for you. Okay, now we're going to, well, what should we do? We've got a million moves here. Let me think for a second. I also have to think, let's go knight c6. Let's stick our knight on this outpost. Queen to b7. Now let's just keep increasing the pressure. How should we do that? Can somebody propose a move? How should we keep increasing the pressure? Let's go queen to a4, absolutely, creating a pin. Now we can take with the rook. Very good, guys. All of you are sharp, I appreciate it. The engagement, okay. So now let's lift the other rook up to b3, let's go. And where is Mr. Queen going here? Now the thing is, if the queen moves out to c7, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, 107 bits, it, it walks right into the x-ray of the other rook. This is what happens when you have well-placed pieces. Um, Mrs. Queen. <laughs> I just, sorry, that was bad. <laughs> Mrs. Queen, of course. Um, but basically, yeah, he's on the ropes. Now, if, he, if, if knight b6 follows here, um, then, well, then we have several things that we can do. Now notice that the queen is undefended here. So if I move the queen, let's say to here, then he will not be able to take the rook uh, because, uh, because the queen will be undefended. But actually this is not so simple. He, he does have a move uh, d5, which I didn't fully anticipate. Uh, but okay, so he's this guy is playing very well. So let me take, let me think for a second here. We're still in good shape, don't worry. Hmm. Okay, so he does this. Wow, that is a very strong move. Yeah, this is actually kind of sticky, I have to say. Okay, we can take the rook though. And now we can slide this rook over to g3. Now I've got to focus, I've got 20 seconds. This might be the strongest opponent we face to date. So, I couldn't have taken the knight, and I'll explain why after the game. It was an insane tactical idea that he came up with. Okay, now we're going to undermine his pawn and create some create some look for our king. Again, I'll explain everything after the game, but you guys can see I have 23 seconds, so i got to play fast. The suspense is on. The Charlie fans came at a great time. Okay, we're going to take the pawn. He gives us a check. We're going to move the king. Now I do happen to like bullet chess. So this is, you know, I'm experienced in these types of situations, but I gotta make a move. My man, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, this guy is vastly underrated, vastly underrated, but I think we'll be fine. All right, drum roll please, ladies and gentlemen. Drum roll please, nobody go anywhere. I'm actually nervous. I'm winning, but I've got 13 seconds. Will I make it? Will I make it?
11 seconds to win the end game. Will I do it? All right, where you've got an end game, I'm up a piece, but I got to win this in nine seconds. I got to start pre moving. We're going to make it happen, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to make it happen. I'm going to win this. Whew, that was close. That was the closest I've come to losing a speedrun game. This guy was incredible. But wait, I still got to win it. I got seven seconds to checkmate him. But the thing is, at some point, this enters your muscle memory. What I'm doing here is I'm doing something called a pre-move. A pre-move is a move that you execute regardless of what your opponent does. It only takes 1.1 1, uh, seconds to make a pre-move, so I'm able to, to make a lot more moves. Now here, I have a queen against the king. This is one of the easiest checkmates in chess. I'll be able to basically checkmate him while pre-moving all of my moves. And what you can see that I'm doing here is I'm cutting off his king. Boom. Boom. And ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a checkmate. What a game. What a game. And the perfect... Yeah, there's so much to talk about here. Now, the one thing I want to emphasize is that it's not about playing games fast. I want to make sure I explain everything so that people actually learn. You guys shouldn't be that impressed. I shouldn't have let this get down this close. Um, and... You know, I, I definitely let this slip a little bit in, so, in some moment, but he played very well. So I, I did my best. Okay, so let's go through this game. Let me unpack everything for you guys. So basically, in the opening, okay, when you start a chess game, basically you want to control the center. The center, broadly speaking, is these four squares that I just highlighted in red. When you control the center, your pieces get more space and you're able to put your pieces on better squares where they can be better positioned to start an attack against your opponent's king. As you guys know, the ultimate objective of the game of chess is to checkmate your opponent's king, to put him in a situation where the king is in check and has no squares. So our opponent were just, was just pushing out his pawns without controlling the center, which is why I got a very nice position at the start. I'm just developing. And here, the move d5 was played. Now, instead of this, what should I have done? What I should have done is try to open up this file for my rook. Sticky br uh, bro, thank you for the prime. How should I have gone about doing that? Can somebody tell me a plan that I can execute to open up that F file? And don't worry, I'll be, I'll be pretty quick here. We'll get started on the next game soon. But, you know, if you guys are in, in here to improve, you want to get better, you know, try to engage, pay attention, ask any questions you want. Um, no such thing as a bad question. It's okay to make mistakes. I'm, I'm, we're here to learn. So I say that every time, and I mean it. Uh, D, the Sony thing with the prime. So knight D2 would have been correct. I did this in the game. Then we push the F pawn to F5, and we take on E6. Now, why would we want to open up the F file? Let's say that he makes a bunch of random moves. The reason we open up the F file is because it's a direct artery to his king. In fact, white has checkmate in two moves. Well, technically in three moves here. Check on H5. And then checkmate on f7. You see how quickly checkmate follows after the king is opened up like this. Um, so that's that's a very, very typical uh, situation. Okay. So instead I played d5. And now I went knight d2. So I, I did the same thing in this position to try to open up that f-file. Appreciate it, breadstick. And, and loving the fact that so many people have stuck around. We've got seven, almost 8,000 viewers. So uh, thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, okay, so I got my knight to a good square. The move a4, why did I play it? I played it to stop b5. If I'd gone knight c4 immediately, he could have kicked my knight away with the move b5. Okay, a4, knight c4. Now let me fast forward to the moment where I basically almost ran out of time. So takes, rook a4. Here I'm just activating all of my pieces, sacrificing a pawn in order to open up the center and to get rid of his bishop. And essentially now, I thought I was completely winning, but he managed to survive. So boom, boom, we get our rook to a great square, and now the fun starts, okay? So let's do this blow by blow. This is called a fork, okay? Not a literal fork. A fork is when a piece attacks two other pieces. You guys see that the knight, the black knight, attacks the queen and the rook. 
But this is called a pin. It's like a flush and a straight in poker. A pin is when there is one piece and another piece and they're in the same line or diagonal. Now, one of the, the pieces that's the piece that's behind the pinned piece, the pinned piece is the knight, has to be of greater value. So a pin is good because the knight can't really move. If the knight moves, he loses his queen, right? That's why this pin is so strong. So it's a fork versus a pin. I moved my queen, which means that if he takes on c4, he drops his queen, and a queen is more valuable than a rook. And I moved my queen to b4 to attack his knight. But now he pushed his pawn out to d5. All of a sudden, this bishop opens up, attacking my queen, and he's attacking my rook. So things get super messy here. This is a discover check. A lot of terminology here, but I'll introduce it bit by bit. The upshot is that this position occurred on the board. This is an amazing position, because here's the thing. I could have taken his knight on b6, okay? That's a free knight, or so it seems. Now, first of all, if he takes my rook, what does white do? I just take his queen, right? If he takes the queen, then my rook, which was being attacked, takes his queen, and I'm up a piece. But what did my devilish opponent cook up here? What does black actually have? And I saw this at the last second. I could have lost this game. This was an amazing idea. Watch this. Who can spot it? Who can spot it? So rook d8, you guys, are is in the right direction. That's exactly the right idea. There's a problem, though. That is defended. You guys have a good eye for tactics. You're seeing the back rank mate. But here's the thing. Queen to d5 does exactly the same thing. Now the queen threatens to checkmate the king. No problem, right? It's okay, okay. Okay, Russian move h3. But wait a second. The rook is also hanging. So, in effect, this is a fork. You're forking checkmate threat and the rook. White cannot defend both at the same time. It would be nice if the rook could travel to e1, but it can't. No matter where you move the rook, you can only block the check, but you can't stave off the mate. There's nothing I can do. If I go rook d3, trying to intercept the queen, then c takes d3. And black will be up a rook for a bishop, which is pretty disastrous situation that's called being up an exchange and so that is why i played rook to g3 and didn't take his knight that's hard to see and kudos to my opponent for finding this now i play h3 this is the pin pawn cannot move because he loses his king that's illegal and so i won a pawn and i got a winning position but at this point i had almost no time and my opponent continued to defend very well now there is one very cool idea i wanted to show you guys this is a fork i attack his rook and i attack his knight what if he had gone rook to b5, defending his knight with his rook? White actually has a beautiful checkmating idea. There's several ways to deliver checkmate, but there's one move that's just very pretty. Who can spot it? Queen to d8 is the fastest mate, but who sees the pretty mate? Knows no Zal is on a roll. This man and, yep, rook h8. Sacrificing the rook, dropping the king to h8, and queen f8 is checkmate. This is a typical pattern. Queen delivers the check. Bishop holds the king back, right? No squares. Queen d8 also was checkmate. This is like the business approach. Queen to h8 is mate is also possible. Or you could go rook h7. So lots of mates here. He correctly gave up a piece. I traded queens, which is normally what you do when you're up material. You want to trade pieces, simplify the game. And of course here I had like six seconds. So I had to try my best, but what I did was that I managed to trade rooks, which made the win a lot simpler for me. Now I tossed his king out of the way and won the pawn and won the game. That's basically what happened. Any questions? And that was a complicated game. There were some details that I didn't, that I kind of left out, uh, but, but I try to sort of give you the thrust of the game and extract the crucial lessons. Great opponent, my opponent played very well. And honestly, if he didn't play such a bad opening, uh, who knows what would have happened? He gave me a pretty big uh, head start by pushing his pawns out like this. Um, I think he played like a 23, 2400 or so. Uh, so big, big kudos to my opponent. Let's go.